Now, I think you're in for a nice surprise if you haven't heard Mr. Ashu Roy speak before because he's amazing. And I've spent the last uh, few months getting to know some of the folks at eGain. And um, while I don't use their products yet, I really enjoy working with them, and I'm really, really thrilled to be here. So I started my career in um, more of the technical realm. I was a programmer back in the day, doing COBOL, and uh, don't want to age myself, but uh, also doing a little bit of web development as well. And then I discovered knowledge management, and I went, wow, there's people and process and content and technology all working together. This is my jam. I love it. I haven't looked back, and that became my career path, it became my passion, and it became the discipline that I love to support so much today. So I spent most of my career working in aerospace and defense um, at a company called Collins Aerospace, which is now a part of the Raytheon uh, conglomerate, and um, got to lead knowledge management teams, work quality, continuous improvement, and spent a lot of time with a lot of engineers who didn't want to share their knowledge all the time, right? So we've all been there. So I'm um, really thrilled to be here today because um, I now work for an organization that um, I've been a part of for many, many years. I've only worked here for 18 months, but I was a member organization with APQC, which stands for the American Productivity and Quality Center. And we do best practice benchmarking studies and collect data in five dis different disciplines. The most popular for our organization is knowledge management, and we've been the leading authority on knowledge management research for a really long time. So if you haven't heard of us, please take a look. Go out to the website. There's a lot of information out there that's available to the public that you don't have to be a member to access, but when you are a member, you get to access a lot more. And um, earlier this year, I got to interview um, Ashu Roy, the CEO of eGain, and we did a great piece on his thoughts around AI and the future of knowledge management. So if you get a chance, go out and take a look at that article. It's fantastic. We had a great time working together on that. So now I get to be in my dream job. I get to do research and talk to people like yourselves about knowledge management up and down the entire life cycle of knowledge management. So when I say that, I'm talking about the cultural aspects, the people, the process, the content components, and yes, the technology components. So today, I'm going to start with a little bit of what we do um, at my company. So we'll look at a few priorities and trends that we're seeing in knowledge management, um, and some AI as well, but it won't be strictly focused on AI. I'm gonna talk, though, a lot about how knowledge management and AI really help to support knowledge transfer because ultimately that is our goal with knowledge management is to ensure that knowledge is being transferred from one person to another, from a system to a person so they can use it for benefit in their jobs every day. Because knowledge management for me, why it became my passion was because I got to go help take pain out of people's workday. They were struggling with something, something wasn't working right. I get to help relieve that pain, and that brings me joy, so I love it. We're also gonna talk about AI and the role that experts play. So APQC's been very interested in digging into to research on the role that experts play in organizations, because they are critical, they're the ones holding the knowledge, right? So how do they work, how do we work with them, and how are they going to work with AI in the future? Okay, and then I'm just gonna finish off by talking a little bit about what does KM look like in the future for us, for you, for everybody around the world who's all focused on it. Okay, so priorities and trends. Again, like I said, we like to start with a little bit of data. So I'm gonna share um, a couple pieces of information. You probably have all seen this, but I always like to start with, you know, what are the big um, professional services firms that are out there doing research saying about AI today? This was something I caught, I'm not, I think it was about a month or so ago, that McKinsey said, here's the seven technologies that will play a big role in the future of artificial intelligence. You probably recognize most of them. AGI is one that's not talked about a lot yet. That's really that component that is, I will say, it's supposed to be the closest to rivaling human intelligence. And according to researchers, it's still decades away. So something to keep your eye on in the future. Right now, I think we're all thinking about generative AI because that's the thing that hit the airwaves a couple of years ago. But as we all know, or may not know, but AI has been around since probably the mid-50s in some way, shape, or form, okay? So that's a little bit of um, technology. 
I need to stop turning my head because I think it makes my voice waver a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is a piece of research from um, my organization, and we like to look at productivity. How does insufficient knowledge management impact productivity? How does it impact a knowledge worker, right? And our research, our latest research, which this is a little bit, this is a little over a year old, says that basically almost 12 hours a week, our knowledge workers are wasting time, basically. Creating duplicate information, um, trying to find people that have the information that they need, trying to find information in a system that's not working well, managing all those internal communications and collaboration systems that are coming at us. And this is the average. So that means some people are struggling more with this, maybe some people a little bit less, depending on their capability. But something to keep an eye on from a knowledge management perspective, we're always looking at trying to reduce the time our knowledge workers look, uh, spend looking for information. Now, the other thing that we have are I'm gonna say outside and inside distractions and disruptions that are, that are um, bothering our knowledge workers every day. Uh, with the onset um, and more focus on AI, we're thinking a lot about data privacy right now, right? We always have, our legal and our IT people have always been thinking about it, but now it's on everyone's mind. Now it's on my mind. Is my information in my bank safe? Is somebody going to hack my credit card again? Because it's happened to everybody probably at some point. So these are the things that keep us up at night, outside of work as well as inside of work. So it distracts our people from doing what they need to do to be the most effective. Transformations. Who here is doing something related to transformation within their organization right now? Pretty much everybody's got some sort of a transformation. It's digital, it's AI, it's organizational. We're changing the org structure again. Um, maybe there's a merger and acquisition going on. Um, it, you name it, there's a transformation going on. It's been a buzzword for a while. It can cause us stress. Some people don't like that change, right? But it's there and we have to deal with it. Social and global issues. There's wars happening around the world. Those can impact people we work with. It can impact the family members of people that we work with. These things distract us. Um, things like elections. Um, what, a week from today? Major election in the United States, right? It's on a lot of people's minds. These are the things that distract us every single day that we have to consider when we're trying to help knowledge workers become more effective. And then, of course, the pace of change. Um, People started talking about this a few years ago when I got introduced to the discipline of change management, which a lot of you have been as well. The pace of change is increasing. The pace of change is increasing. Well, we stop saying that. It's pretty much just change is happening all the time, right? It's constant. It's moving. Something's always going to be happening. So we have to learn as knowledge managers and knowledge management leaders to help our organizations deal with that pace of change. Not adding to the pain in their day, but helping to relieve them from the pain that they're experiencing in the day. Okay, so a little bit more data. These are, we do a priorities and trends survey every year uh, with the members of our organization, and they tell us what are those top priorities, what are those top drivers, what are the things that your business is thinking about? So where are you gonna be focusing your attention? On the left side of this, you'll see the priorities and drivers for knowledge management teams. It's always about identifying and mapping and prioritizing what's the most critical knowledge in the organization because that's where we're gonna focus our attention with our tools, our content strategies, and so on. But this year, popping at number two for the first time is that concept of incorporating AI and generative AI. Now, we've had AI on our list of priorities for a really long time, but it's never made it in the top five until this, the last two years because of the gen AI bubble, if you will. And then, of course, transferring expert knowledge. We're always thinking about transferring expert knowledge. And we have multiple priorities that KM teams are focused on, but those are some of the top. Then we also have where we ask the question, what is your business most thinking about? What are their priorities right now? And for the first time ever, operational efficiency and process improvement was at the top of the list, by far. I think it's driven because, <clears throat> excuse me, CEOs are, I want Gen AI and I want it now and I want it to improve my efficiencies by this much by the end of the year, right? This is what we're hearing, this is what we're having to deal with, so it, it jumped to the top of the list. Now, for knowledge management, people, to me, this is 
great opportunity. You finally care about operational efficiency. We can help you with that, right? So take advantage of these opportunities that we see our businesses are focusing on this. That's where KM steps up and say, says, how can we help? We're here to help you. We know how to do these things. And we're still focused on continuous learning, right? We're bringing new people in. There's people leaving the company. Experts are, are retiring. We've got to deal with all of that. We've got to deal with continuous learning. And things like strategic integration, um, we had a breakfast this morning with a few people before this, this event started, and uh, a lot of people talked about that concept of you know, moving across silos, partnering with IT organizations so that you can implement great AI strategies and other digital strategies for your organization. So these are the things important to businesses right now as well. Okay, now, <clears throat> as far as AI goes, we did a study just a few months ago on emerging technologies for knowledge management. This one was specifically around AI. We asked them, what is your current level of investment for AI in your organization? And I think you can see there's about 43% of people are at least moderately invested, if not very or extremely invested in AI. And some are just getting started, and some haven't started at all. We're seeing some trends in maybe the government um, agencies that aren't, aren't jumping in as quickly maybe as possible um, with some of the uh, industries that are taking on AI. But look at the difference in their expected change in investment over the next three years. We moved to 86% of people are saying they're going to increase it at least a little, if not a lot. So they're going to be investing in AI if they haven't started already. So just something to keep an eye on, something to think about as you're working with your organizations. This is top of mind for business leaders. It's top of mind for where we're going to spend our money, right? Okay. Now, the last thing from a data perspective that I wanted to show you was what were those expected benefits of implementing AI in organizations? And you can imagine, this is not a surprise, reducing redundant and siloed work and streamlining processes. Kind of aligns with that whole uh, business priority of operational efficiency and process improvement. Makes a lot of sense. Again, I think very driven by this latest generative AI bubble but it's also there to help us make better decisions. We want accurate information to help us make better and faster decisions. And the last two, as a knowledge management person, I really love because we can use some of these capabilities to help improve our content management strategies, which a lot of times we have a hard time getting people's attention around, getting them to pay attention to this. So how can we leverage AI to help us with those content and taxonomy strategies that we, we are working on? And then finally, that information management quality component is very important. Um, this is something we expect to be a benefit, but it's also something we have to manage very closely because AI does not fix everything, right? We still have to be there to validate the information and ensure that it's accurate and timely and relevant to our organization. So, with that being said, I say these are the expected benefits. These aren't necessarily what everyone is seeing right away with their initial implementations. So we talk to members on a regular basis and say, tell us about your AI deployment. You were so excited about it six months ago. And usually it's, we've had to scale it back a little bit because it's harder than we thought. Um, or we got in, I had one member tell me, we, and they were very early adopters, large pharmaceutical company, very early adopters of uh, building their own Gen AI solution. And they said, we identified seven or eight business cases or use cases to apply our tool to. And once we started um, getting ready to deploy some of the pilots, we started digging in and realized that there was a couple of those use cases there was no way they were going to be able to apply the AI to. The data was in terrible shape. It was extremely unstructured. They have no content owners. They didn't know. It, it's that whole garbage in, garbage out thing. Even with AI, you've got to take care of your content and your data, or it's not going to work as effectively. Now, again, some of those AI tools can help you with creating more structured data, but you've got to know what you have. So they backed off, and they said, you know what? We just went back to the drawing board. We went back. We put some governance in place, um, applied our content management strategies to those two areas, and moved forward with the other use cases. So don't, don't get discouraged if you're doing things like that, right? You might have a couple of bumps in the road, but I think it's good to go back and make sure you're looking um, at the data and at the content you have and making sure that it's in a place because the worst thing you can do is put a solution in place and have the content quality be so poor that no one trusts it. 
right? They're never gonna trust it again. If 40% is right, that's not good enough, right? People aren't going to be a part of that. Now in a pilot, they'll be willing to help you work through that, but in the end, you've got to get to that quality of answers that, that you're coming back with, with AI. So, okay, enough of data for a little while, um, but again, a research company, so I like to throw out some of the, the data that shows you what other people are working on. So, I'm gonna talk a little bit about KM and AI to transfer knowledge. And this is gonna feel maybe a little bit philosophical at first, but hopefully you understand why I'm really focusing on this. Because again, ultimately the goal of knowledge management is to ensure that knowledge is actually transferred to the person who needs it in the moment they need it. So they can serve a customer, an internal or external customer, either one. What we've realized in doing research all these years is we've implemented some great knowledge management capabilities. People have put communities of practice in place. We've built knowledge bases. We have lessons learned capabilities. We have content management strategies and life cycles that are in place. But what we haven't always done is gone back and said, so someone attended the community of practice, but what did they do with the information that they just heard? Did they share it with someone else? Did they take it back and apply it to their job? Or did they just come to get an hour out of their day that they didn't want to you know, do anything else and they wanted to come listen to an expert talk? We don't always know the answers to those questions. Even when we look at knowledge bases and say, how many clicks did we get this month? Or how many downloads did we have on this content? Um, it's the same for me. In, in my company, people search our resource library for research. I can see how many people download it. But I have no idea if it did them any good unless they tell me. Right? So we have to be very intentional about ensuring that what we're doing and what we're putting in place is actually getting transferred to the person who needs it. Okay? And we say, let's not do KM for KM's sake. Let's do it for the people who need the knowledge. Not the ones that have it necessarily, but the ones who need it. Okay, so what do I mean when I say knowledge transfer then very specifically? So again, this is a little bit of the philosophical part, but I like this. I think this kind of tells the story of how knowledge moves through the organization. And this is a, a, a flow diagram that we created at APQC many, many years ago, and I think it's still valid today. If you see where the wheel starts with create, there's knowledge that's created. Someone's got something that they know and experience, right? They've got that knowledge. We identify that as valuable or unique. Then we say, we need to write that down. We need to collect that. We need to put that in this system. We need to share it with other people. So we review it. We validate that it's, it's, it's something that's important to our organization. And then we begin the sharing process. Again, whether it's through a knowledge base where people can access it self-serve, or whether it's in a community of practice where an expert's talking to other people. And then we want to make sure that people can access it ongoing, continuously. Once that information is written down and made explicit for people, how do they continue to access it? The use that's on this circle is highlighted blue because there's no value in this process until someone has actually grabbed that information for themselves and applied it, again, in the work that they do every single day, in their teachable moment. I needed to know something new so that I could be more effective in my job. I got this information from whatever source, and now I'm using it. And when you begin to use it, a lot of times you take that knowledge that you've just gained and you build upon it. So now you're innovating and you're creating new knowledge, and the cycle starts all over again. But it's hard to be very intentional with this. And for years, I think we just assumed that the, we put it out there, people are using it, it's happened. They've got the knowledge. I don't know that we always know that. So again, let's make sure people are using it on the other end, how they're using it, and we're tracking how they're using it, and if they're innovating and creating new knowledge, are we making sure that's getting captured as well? And the reason I talk about knowledge transfer, but you notice that those words aren't on this process anywhere, because knowledge transfer can actually happen intentionally or unintentionally throughout this whole cycle. So I worked in knowledge management teams for years and I did interviews with experts and I sat down with community leaders and um, had conversations with people. I was collecting all that knowledge in my own head just while I was doing that for the sake of writing it down and then sharing it with others. So knowledge transfer can happen unintentionally or intentionally throughout this process. But we as knowledge managers, I think we need to really focus on that intentional way of doing things because we wanna make sure that it's the knowledge that we are collecting and capturing and making available is actually being used again when someone needs it, 
okay? Told you it was a little philosophical. Now, I'm gonna dig even deeper, just for a second. And the reason that it's important to understand the flow of knowledge is because transferring knowledge is really complex. Like I said, I think we always think we can make a system or we can put something out there and people will grab it and they'll be happy. Well, did they, know, did they really um, internalize it? Do they understand it, right? That's what we're shooting for. This is a model that was created, I think it was in the mid-90s by Nunaka. It's, um, I've got the source down below. And it's called the Seki model. A lot of people have probably seen it, S-E-C-I. But it shows you how tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge can kind of work together to create that cycle of knowledge flow that we're really shooting for. So the top and the left, you'll see tacit. And tacit knowledge is that what's in people's heads, right? I always say behind the eyes and between the ears. It's the stuff that's really hard to write down, okay? And the explicit on the right and the bottom of this um, quadrant here, that's the stuff that you can write down, that you can capture, okay? When you start with the tacit, tacit, that's really that socialization. We're having a conversation. We're just, I'm telling you about all the great things that I know, and you're just kind of soaking it in. That's a tacit to tacit exchange. But once we begin to have a dialogue, and you begin to reflect on that, and we start having a conversation really that's more two-way back and forth, we're starting to make that a little bit more external, which means we can capture it, we can record it, we can write it down, we can do those things. Now, when you get to the bottom in this, what we call the combination box, this is where, this is the easiest and probably where a lot of us tend to focus with our content management strategies. This is the stuff you can write down. These are the guidelines, standard operating procedures, process flow documents and things like that, that we write down, we make them formal, and then we make them available to others, okay? That's great, we have to do those things. They're the easiest, and a lot of times it's where we start because it might be the easiest. But then you get to internalization. This is where I've taken something, like I said, something that was explicitly written down, and now I'm applying it to what I'm doing in my job. So I'm learning, I'm internalizing it, and I'm figuring out how to then use it in the context of my role, for my situation, in the moment when I need it the most. And as I continue to do that and learn and, and do that even better, again, I begin to innovate and create new knowledge, and then I go up and the cycle starts all over again. So this is just really a complexity model, and I'm not trying to make anyone's jobs harder. I just think it's interesting to look at we're talking about human beings here that have knowledge in their heads, and we're trying to get it to a place that we can preserve it for the future of our organizations and for future generations. And someone else at the breakfast this morning said something very interesting, which I love, the study of generations. And every generation wants to see it differently. They want to access it differently. They want to learn differently. So you want to add another level of complexity to this. We need to make this like a 3D or a 4D model, right? And say, then it depends on who you are and how you learn. Maybe even depends on the part of the country that you live in or the part of the world that you live in, right? So it's a complex thing when we talk about knowledge, which is why we're probably always going to have work to do and it's probably always going to be a priority within our organizations. So I think that's a good thing. We need to, do I need to breathe for a second? Maybe that was a lot. There's a lot of philosophy. I didn't mean to do that, but I just feel like sometimes we lose sight of knowledge management being the ultimate goal is really to transfer knowledge from one human being to another, whether it's the human to human or the human to machine, machine to human. All of those things exist, right? Okay. Now, what makes successful knowledge transfer happen? Motivation of the source and the recipient. Anybody ever had an expert in their organization want to sit in their office, keep the door closed, and just do their job and be left alone? I mean, you know, I worked with engineers for years, and they loved it. They sat up in their, their, their offices with their patents lining the wall, right, because they're brilliant, and they didn't want to share their information. Um, they thought the knowledge was power. So the role of the knowledge management team was to help convince these people that they mattered, and that what they said mattered, that their experiences mattered, and that them sharing their knowledge was the best gift they could give back to the organization, and that's where the power really came in. When you share what you know, you might even learn something from someone else in the process, right? So you have to have the motivation of the source, the person who needs to share the information, and the recipient. Some people aren't always open. This is the way I've always done it. I don't want to do it any different. This is the way I'm going to do it. 
Sometimes there's new ways to do things. So the recipient and the motivation, or, and the source have to be motivated. And I would actually argue this is true for humans and machines, okay? So the motivation of the machine that you have in place, I know it sounds strange because the machine is not human, but does it have what I need? Has it been trustworthy to me in the past? I might not be motivated to listen to what's coming out of this machine if it hasn't done me any good in the past, okay? So then when you move on to the quality of the relationship, that's what that speaks to. Do I know this person? Do I trust them? Do I trust them to be an expert? I, am I going to learn something that will be value added for my job from today and in the future that I can then pass on to other people? That quality of the relationship is so, so important. And this morning, again, in the breakfast that I was in, someone asked the question of um, what can you do to um, better partner with organizations across you know, break down silos. And no one necessarily said this, but my first thought in my mind was, I, I go build a relationship with that person first before I ask them for anything, right? I go talk to them, find out what they do, show interest, right? Be curious about what other people are doing, and they will let you in, and they'll, they'll create a relationship with you when you need it, okay? I don't like to ask for something the first time I meet them. I like to meet with them, I like to get to know them, find some commonalities. And then you go in for the, okay, how can you help us? <laughs> you know, so the quality of the relationship is important. Understanding the work is also important. This is both the tacit and the explicit again. Understanding the work means I know how to do my job because I have standard operating procedures or process documents or so on that help me, and I know where to find all of those things and they're valuable to me, but I also know the experiential component. I know that when I do that step in the process, I need to consider these three things because the expert told me that. Or I learned it over time with my own failures and my own successes, right? So understanding the work is extremely important as well to ensure that transfer is happening. Finally, facilitation and support. This is where knowledge management teams come in. They help to facilitate the knowledge transfer happening, whether it's through systems, whether it's through interviews you might do with uh, experts, whether it's through making sure communities are set up so that people who have like interests and work in like areas across the company can share across silos. The facilitation needs to be there, and I think that is a lot the role of the knowledge management teams and the people who champion for us. Those knowledge um, champions out in the business are content owners, community practice leaders, and so on. But you also have to have the support side. Leadership. Having them buy into the concept that knowledge transfer and knowledge management is important is, is probably one of the most critical things you have because are they making space for that to happen in the organization? Do people have time to learn and share from one another? Do we have time and money to create the systems we need to ensure that people have what they need to be successful? That leadership support um, of making sure resources and tools are available is extremely valuable. But so is then rewarding that behavior, right? So that's built into the culture of your organization. I'm going to reward the people who do these things and ensure that knowledge transfer is happening for generations to come in our organization. And that's also a very critical part of what your leaders can do for you, okay? That's a lot, right? Just to talk about knowledge transfer, all these things kind of have to be in place. And I know it's a lot to think about, but I just, I want to throw some different things out there for you to think about as you're kind of building your systems and building your capabilities that this is a complex thing because, mostly because humans are there and we get in the way, right? It's what we do, we're human. Okay, so now let's talk about specifically how does knowledge management support the transfer of knowledge? And a lot of you know this, but I'm gonna zip through this anyway. We help with identifying what's the significance of the knowledge that we need. What's unique? What helps us to be competitive? What's the most critical thing that we need to be focusing on? We cannot and we should not focus on all the knowledge in our organization. It's not always relevant at this point in time. So think about those business priorities. Think about the objectives you're working on today and figure out what's the critical knowledge you need to ensure that those things happen. Then we have self-service approaches. We all know this, tools, we have social tools, we have knowledge bases, we have things that we put out there for people because it's more efficient for them to be able to access it themselves, and that's a great thing, and we will continue to build self-service capabilities and support those in KM teams from here on out. Peer-to-peer -peer approaches. These are personally some of my favorite because I like working with the humans, um, but one-to-one -one mentoring. Um, experts sharing with um, new generations, right? Um, communities of practice, which is more of your many-to-many. -many. How many of you, I should say, 
know what a community's practice is or have them in your organizations today. Do any of you have communities? Awesome, okay. They're my favorite because again, I think it's the first place you go when you're trying to solve a knowledge problem because before you apply a tool or you do anything else, you say, who has the knowledge and where are they located in the organization and do they even know each other? Let's get them together and let's make sure they're talking to one another so that they're not working in silos and then let's get them to help us create the systems we need to ensure the knowledge transfer is happening in that specific topic area or that specific domain, okay? Then we have process approaches. These are those more specific things um, that a lot of people have, like a lessons learned approach that might be built into your project or program management methodology, and maybe the KM team manages what that looks like, what tool you use to do that, what process steps you follow throughout. Um, it could be your content management strategy. You have a life cycle, that, and you have content owners, and you have those defined, and you have criteria for all of those things. Very process driven, very important. And then finally, we have those learning approaches, which helps us to build that learning organization and ensure knowledge transfer happens. These are those expert-led um, workshops or trainings that go on. Or it could be that it's the knowledge management team actually facilitating a design thinking workshop or something to help a business area solve an actual problem. So these sound familiar to people? A lot of you have these things in place? OK, fantastic. Okay, so how does AI then support this whole concept of knowledge management and transfer? Now this is just a look at, from our emerging technologies research we did earlier this year, these were some of the common use cases that our knowledge management professionals and leaders were reporting that they were either working on or they were intending to work on. So a lot of these probably look familiar to you, right? We're going to automate data analytics. We're gonna auto tag or classify our content if we're not already doing that. Uh, maybe work on personalization a little bit, although I don't hear as much about that anymore. Um, we're gonna create new content with Gen AI. Uh, a lot of people that we talk to, a lot of our members, they um, are using some of the simpler forms at first, like AI meeting summaries that come along with tools like Zoom or Microsoft, and, and we're using those and they help us to identify what we talked about and also maybe what some of the action items were. They're using things like that, a little bit, little bit simpler. Um, some people are not, um, I don't know about you all, but the creating new content, um, people are a little bit leery of that. They said, well, I want to write a communication, so I write it first, then I put it into the tool, and then I bring it back out again, and then I still edit it, right? So we're not completely trusting that whole new content, but it helps us. It helps us to be more concise and maybe get a little bit better with our communications. An interesting thing about enhancing community and network involvement, this is that area of communities of practice. We have a couple of member organizations that said that they treat their AI bot as another member of the community. So they give them a special name sometimes and they're like, hey, Charlie's gonna be along for the ride today with this community or whatever you've named it. And they ask it the same questions that are being talked about in the community just to see what kinds of information exists in the organization and what kinds of responses they're going to get back and how valid is it. And then the community helps to validate is this giving us quality and accurate data coming back from our, from our bot? So kind of interesting things. Um, I see a lot of people saying they want to use um, AI for more R&D and scientific discovery, but we don't really have a lot of examples of those yet. If anybody else does, I'd love to hear it because I think that's a little bit further to really help us make discoveries. We have to get a lot of our, I'm gonna say our data and our content in order for that to really happen. Um, but I did have one organization that shared that they were using it for their request for proposal, their RFP process. They were um, scanning the, the database that they use for that and creating templates out of the consistent uh, things that they were seeing across multiple RFPs so that if somebody went to create a new one, they could grab one of those templates based on what everyone else had done and at least not be starting from scratch or only starting from their own knowledge level of their RFPs. So using it for lots and lots of different um, capabilities. But the one thing, or the two things I'll say that everybody is doing is they're making sure that these use cases are aligned to their business priorities, first and foremost. And a lot of knowledge management teams at first came to us in a panic because they said, our CEO or our leader of digital or whoever they want to implement AI and they need it done by the end of the year and we're supposed to be able to come, with, come up with a solution. And my response always to them was to go back to them and say, why? What for? 
What problem are you intending to solve with AI? And I think most business leaders now have been able to back the train up a little bit and say, oh, okay, well, we want to focus just on this, this, that, you know, and you get some priorities out of it. But at first it was a little scary, and um, some teams were a little bit like, we don't know what to do. Go back and ask them what. Fo help them focus on just the business priorities that matter right now. We can't do it for everything. So I think the hype, what do they call that? The hype cycle, right? At first, everybody was here. I think we've come down to more realistic expectations maybe now in this space of AI. Um, the other thing that a lot of our organizations are doing as it relates to, the, to AI is that they're becoming that, um, that change manager, that human component, right, for, for AI. They're helping to educate the workforce on what it is and what it's not and help to dispel maybe some of the fears within the organization. Um, how many of you think that part of your role in knowledge management is also that of a change manager or a coach or a, you know, sometimes a counselor, <laughs> right? Um, people come to you for these things because you help them solve problems. So I think it's, it's amazing what the new technology can do, but we're still dealing with humans. Okay, and why it's important for us to talk about KM and AI together is that I think when we start using what we know traditionally of knowledge management and now what we're learning and know about AI, it gets us that much closer to what we like to call at APQC that teachable moment. That knowledge that I need when I need it, in the flow, in the moment, when I'm working without having to go over here to get it, but I can actually access it right here in the flow of my work, which just improves the user experience. So when we ask um, in our priorities survey what's important for the user experience to be effective, the top three things were simplified, not a, not a surprise there, right? We want to make the user experience less confusing, more intuitive, all of that. We want it in the flow, right? In the flow was the number one, meaning it needs to show up in our work applications and our processes, not something extra outside of, I don't want to leave what I'm doing to go find something else. Context switching is one of the most um, unproductive things that we can force our knowledge workers to do on a regular basis. And then finally, automated. And this is new to our user experience uh, data this year, and it popped in at 20%. We want automated. People are saying they, they want it. We're not afraid of it. We want to automate some of those manual and, and, and mundane tasks so that we can actually focus on innovation and strategy. We never have time to do that. So how do we automate? So again, when you bring together what we know about knowledge management and you bring together that AI, I think we can get ourselves even closer to getting that great user experience um, that we're really searching for. Okay? Okay, now I'm gonna talk about experts. So AI and the role of experts. How many of you in your organizations have some sort of a um, expert program at all? like a fellows program or a technical expertise program where it's the highest level of technical experts in your organization and they are either rewarded, they have different titles, you treat them special, anything like that? Nobody? So what we're finding in our research and with a lot of the companies that we work with is those organizations that do really focus on the role of the expert in the organization have the highest level of knowledge management maturity in their organizations. Because they've made knowledge management and knowledge transfer a part of an expert's responsibilities, right? It's an expectation. You don't get, again, just get to be the expert that sits over in the corner with your patents hanging on the wall. You have to be there to give back. It's part of what you need to do as an expert. So we're gonna be digging more into research as it relates to experts um, in my organization going forward. I'm really excited about it, doing some member roundtables and doing some uh, surveys and things like that. So we'll get more information on what that really looks like. But um, personally, I experienced having a technical fellow program when I worked in aerospace, and it was phenomenal because part of the requirements of being a technical fellow was you had to teach, you had to either lead or participate in a community of practice, you had to contribute to knowledge articles. You had to do these things in order to be even considered for being a technical expert. And then we had a reward program that rewarded our top experts as well, right? So it gave them incentive to, be, to do what they in, intuitively 
probably should be doing in the first place, but they just didn't know and they didn't have time, right? So we made that something that was more intentional for the experts in our organization. Okay, so when you think about experts and really any knowledge worker, we always say put the knowledge where people are going to trip over it. And I know I sound like a broken record when I talk about putting the knowledge in the flow of work, but this is what it means. Put it where they're gonna trip over it, right? Put it into the work. What systems are they accessing every day? What processes are they referencing? Who are they talking to? Put it in the work that they do every single day and build it into their roles. Make it an expectation. Reward them when they do it well. Make it part of career development. Make it part of their job description. This is when you really start to move the needle in the knowledge sharing, and um, again, I always say preserving the knowledge for future generations because that's what it means. If we don't do these things, when you find out Joe is retiring in 30 days and everybody scrambles to go, oh my gosh, we have to go talk to him, we have to write down everything he knows, at that point, do you think he's motivated and willing to do it? Maybe not. And even if he is, do you really think you can get his 30 or 35 or 40 years of experience written down and captured appropriately? In, in a 30-day window? Probably not. Um, so it's, and even if he hasn't worked at your company for all those years, he still has 30 or 40 years of experience, even if it was with 10 companies, right? It's valid, it's important. We need to be building it into the life cycle of our knowledge workers, okay? So when you're thinking about your solutions, and you're thinking about the generations and how people learn and do all that kind of stuff, also think about the life cycle of the knowledge worker. And even though we think about generations, I also think there's still a lot of generalization there as well, right? I'm old, and yet I love self-service stuff, and I don't like to necessarily talk to people on the phone for customer service or anything like that, but that goes against the grain of probably my generational preference, right? So we have to always consider that everyone's going to have, need something a little bit different at different points of time. So think about the life cycle of a knowledge worker in this way. We have those people who are entering into the workforce. You have your early career talent. You have your new hires. Or you have people who maybe transitioned in from another company, because people, I think, change jobs a little bit more than they used to, right? So they're moving from company to company, and when they come in, they're a novice in your organization, right? They bring experience, but they still don't know all of your work systems. So you've got to think about how we treat those people. And in most cases, we do. We have onboarding programs, or we have training you have to take when you start a company, or maybe you're assigned a mentor right away, and that's fantastic. The other end of this pipeline is our experts, those people who are considered, well, go talk to you know, Sally over there. She knows everything. She's been here for 35 years. She'll tell you where it's at. That's great, too. We put a lot of focus sometimes on, on our experts, and we all know who they are, right? Even if we don't have an expert program or anything, we probably know who they are. Who knows this? We got to go talk to this person. The people in the middle sometimes get left out. You know, we don't always have programs in place, we don't always have things in place to help those people that we like to call experts. And I have to give credit to Lockheed Martin because they're the company that came up with this, this terminology probably 15 years ago in a workshop that I was in with them, and we were collaborating across companies. And they said, we like to think of our, that next generation of experts as experts, And we like to give them special consideration with what we're doing. Because they're no longer in the early bucket. They know enough, they've been around, right? They've got some experience, they've got their own stories, their own failures, their own successes. But they're not yet the expert. And they're kind of caught in the middle. So what are we doing for those next experts? And what responsibilities are we giving to these people to make sure that they're getting engaged in the knowledge transfer activities or the knowledge management? Are we making them community leaders? Are we having them create content? Are we having them validate content, right? They may not be as much of an expert, but they can get there and they can learn. And then how are we ensuring that these three groups of people are actually working together? Are we, how are the experts teaching the next experts how to be a good expert and some of those responsibilities and so on? So think about the life cycle of your knowledge worker when you're thinking about um, what people need when they need it and maybe where are they at in that life cycle of their work, okay? Okay, and then, uh, because like I said, I love humans, I like to talk about what does it take to make a good expert? And I think this is important because I think in order for you to make your systems effective in knowledge management, or even leveraging AI systems, you need to make sure that, that the experts understand how they can contribute back to this process, right? We need them to be able to build relationships. Again, I spent most of my career working with engineers. 
They're not the most extroverted people, if you didn't know that, but they're brilliant. And when you begin to have a conversation with them about something that they care about, they are phenomenal conversationalists, and they will share, and they will discuss, right? So build the relationships with the people that you need the knowledge from, whether they're introverted, extroverted, technical, non-technical, whatever that looks like. But if they're experts and they're important to your AI and your KM strategy, we need to help them develop these skill sets if they don't have them already. We want our experts to entertain and inspire. People learn through stories. We want to hear the story of the time that you messed up that project and, and did something wrong, and then how did you recover from it, and what did that look like, and how did that make you feel, and what do we do now that's different than what you did then so that we don't do that again in the future, right? It's important to be able to be inspired by the people that you look up to in your organization. And the bottom line is also, too, that they need to talk about how they impacted the bottom line, right? It's not just about the story, what did I learn, how did I feel, but it's how did that impact the bottom line? Why did we do this? Because it brought value to our business in the end. It's always back to the business value. And in the end, they are there to convey their wisdom. We need them to convey their wisdom, and we need them to do that so that we can evolve our culture into the future. And you can do that really well if you can really pull in those experts in your organization. They're maybe not all gonna be willing, but they're probably more willing than you, than you might think they are if you give them the right tools to be successful. Okay, so what can experts do then to help us harness AI? And you guys are probably already doing a lot of this, but they can help train the machines, right? They're the ones that have the expertise. The IT guys are creating the systems. Have them help you make those machines, that machine learning work more effectively. They have the knowledge that you need. Have them evaluate the outputs and tell you what's right, what's wrong, and make those adjustments that you need to to the models so that the AI is actually working effectively. They help to enrich the content because of their expertise, and they actually help bring more innovative thinking, right? Because they bring a fresh perspective. They have many years of experience, and they apply all of this as you're training your models to be the most effective they can be. So harness those experts if you haven't already. This is, I think, a very important and a very validating role for these experts who some might think that, is AI gonna take my job? No, we can't do it without you. Right? That's the line. We can't do it without you because the machines aren't as smart as you are until it's, apply, it's applying the knowledge you have back to the machine. Right? Feed the, feed the um, I'll say ego, if you will, of the experts. Right? This is what they need because they've been doing something the same way for so many years and this feels different and scary. Right? Okay. So, looking ahead from a knowledge management perspective, the changing role of knowledge management. Now first, I want to talk about the words first responder that I have listed on this slide. This is not new. This is a concept that, um, again, I was in a workshop with many companies years ago and we were talking about the role of knowledge management and the types of people who worked in knowledge management and what it took. And I said, I kind of feel like a first responder sometimes. Right? The first on the scene, there's a crisis. We have a supply chain crisis. We got a team of people together in a, in, a, in a war room, and we figured out how to deal with the supply chain crisis going on around the world so that we can continue to move our product. Right, Things like that. We feel like first responders. Again, we're there to help remove pain in people's day, make their jobs more effective, and give them the information they need in their most teachable moment. So this is, I wanted to say that because I always think of, of knowledge management as a first responder, and I don't think that's going to change. In fact, I think it's actually accelerated because of the role of AI now. And our um, chairman of APQC, Dr. Carla O'Dell, she attended a, a member roundtable that we had a, um, a few months ago where we were talking about this. And she said, you know, KM involvement in technologies like SharePoint and other collaboration tools, and I would even argue search, right, and the internet in general back in the 90s, right? KM's involvement in that really set the stage. So when the companies looked around and said, who can help us with this AI beast that has now been brought to our attention, KM was there, and we've stepped in, and we're going to help. And it has brought more attention, I think, to knowledge management as well. So it's a good thing. It's an opportunity. And some of the things you see on this chart are from our members who have said, this is what it feels like for me in my organization since the onset of AI, right? Now, all of a sudden, people are paying attention to KM, 
because they, they know we can help them, and we are. We're gonna step in, we're gonna help them, and we're bringing our traditional knowledge management capabilities right along with us so they can continue to learn and morph their knowledge management strategy. You know, the overall interest is high, they're focusing in on pilots and exper experiments like I talked about before, and AI is moving from a more like to have to a must have. A lot of KMers have been talking about AI for many years, and they've been using machine learning, and they've been using large language models, all of that stuff. Not a lot of people were always paying attention. Now they're paying attention. So this is, again, a good thing. Um, I liked one person said, I have two jobs now. I'm a KM director, and I'm also running an AI startup company. That's what I feel like. And I think that feels very relevant for a lot of people, right? So it's hard to balance what do I focus on from traditional knowledge management, and how do I bring this AI in here as well? Um, they're also, KM teams are also really helping to define the strategies for AI for their organizations. Now, our research tells us that only about 14% of the people who responded to our emerging technologies um, research study actually report into the digital or IT organization. But yet AI is a tool. So how do you get that partnership? How do you cross that line? How do you get a seat at the table in helping to define the AI strategy for your organization when you don't even report to the organization who's taking on the responsibility to do it, okay? This is where we had a member and I loved this. I said, how did you get in? You've never had a great relationship with digital in your organization before. How did you get a seat at the table for AI this time around? She goes, you know, she goes, I didn't take no for an answer. And she said, there wasn't a seat for me at the table, so I got my own folding chair and I drug it right up to the table and said, I'm here, I'm knowledge management, and I can help you with this because I know the business priorities, I know where the critical knowledge is, I know who the experts are, and we can help you with this. And she kind of built that, she just kind of pushed a little bit and got in there and built that relationship. So no matter where you are in the organization, you're gonna have to partner with somebody right, to do this, because this is an enterprise thing. This morning I heard several people say that there's kind of a center of excellence that might be being put in place in a lot of organizations where maybe it's a combination of some cross-functional groups coming together to figure out what to do with AI. Well, that's probably good for now, but is that gonna stay around forever? Someday somebody's gonna kind of have to own the technology and then somebody's gonna have to own the user experience and all of that. What's that look like? How can you get involved in that and how can you be a part of that long-term solution from a KM perspective? The last couple things I'll say is that, again, a lot of the AI has brought to light the importance of good content management and quality information, which is great. KMers have been trying to get that focus from their business leaders for many, many years and don't always get it. This is helping, so that's a good thing. Um, but I think almost more importantly is that KM is really acting, as I said earlier, as the people side of AI transformations. And I think this is really important because in our research, when we ask knowledge management professionals, what are the most important skill sets for knowledge management to develop? You'll notice that these top six, and we had, there was probably like 18 or 20 to choose from, these are, other than data management, these are all human-focused skills. These are soft skills, if you will. And change management has been the number one skill set for knowledge management teams to develop. This is a three-year look, but it goes back even beyond that to at least four years from our data. It says change management's the number one. So we've been doing a lot of research on change management in this space of knowledge management to say what are people doing to ensure adoption and buy-in from leaders and actual use of these capabilities that we're putting in place so that we can ensure knowledge transfer is happening. And it's critical. But these other things, uh, critical thinking, problem solving, partnership and collaboration, look at that number jump just this last year. Again, that's driven by AI. The AI bubble, that's driven that big time because now KM is out there partnering with their digital uh, user experience organizations, right? So just something to keep in mind. These are the top skill sets. We're getting ready to do our research. Um, in fact, our survey goes out next week, I believe, for 2025 priorities, and we do it every 12 months, right? And we keep an eye on what people are focusing on, and it's, it's very helpful. Okay, so what can KM do to harness AI? We talked about what experts can do. Now what can KM do? And we've talked about all of this already, right? Partnering with the business and preparing the culture but don't forget to apply the foundational knowledge management that you've already been working on for how many years? That's a critical component. You're just leveraging AI to help some of those things improve, 
but you're also leveraging AI to help prepare the future of your organization for that humans and machines working together a little bit more effectively, right? And then finally, manage the change. Again, focus on that, those change management skills. Some people have change management organizations. Do any of you have change management organizations or specialists in your organization to help with the people side? Some people do. Um, but it is a critical skill set still for those knowledge management teams because you're always, you're asking people to work differently. You're asking them to access new systems and so on. Okay. So, this was our, this was my attempt at a little play on words. So we have AI, which we all know what it is. But I say that when you add that, I think that artificial intelligence can really sing amazingly when it's combined with the other AI, which I like to call appreciative inquiry, and that's that human side. That's, that's a methodology where you really dig in to the culture of your organization and you figure out what do we do well, what's the, what's the strengths of our organization, how can we leverage those things to improve how knowledge transfer transfers across the organization, how knowledge is flowing. And when you combine that component, the human side, with the actual technology side of AI, you get a third AI. You get amazing insights, right? So AI plus AI equals AI. So it's just something to remember that you want to make sure that you're thinking about the technology component. But more importantly, AI is not to me, a digital transformation, it's a cultural transformation. Because it's scary, and it's different, and it's new, and it's exciting, and name your adjective depending on what you do on how you feel about it, and we have to deal with all of those things. So, finally, just to say, remember, what you're doing knowledge management, and you're doing AI, and you're building your strategies, it's the knowledge that drives all of this. This is why we do this. The knowledge of what's the most important and critical and unique in our organization, what are those domains and assets of knowledge we really care about, how do we leverage the tools and techniques to ensure transfer happens, and um, identify those gaps and those risks, and then how are we intentional about closing those gaps, right? Don't just throw it out there. People aren't just going to come. If you build it, they will not just come, just to reference a movie. From Iowa, which is where I'm from, by the way. Sorry, I have to say that. Um, but. It is about identifying an intentional plan for knowledge transfer. That's ultimately what we're trying to do, is get knowledge in the hands of people when they need it in their most teachable moment. Because people systems make technology systems work. Knowledge transfer that we talked about, it's a human thing. It's a cultural thing. Knowledge management is a human thing. It's a cultural thing. It's the how we help knowledge to move through the organization. It's still human focused. AI is also cultural. And the technology is going to continue to change and morph, and it's going to become amazing. By the time you come back to this conference next year, imagine the things that will happen before then, right? The amazing things that will, will happen. But ultimately, it's a cultural thing, and it's about humans and machines learning to work together most eff more effectively than we ever have before, and how people feel about that in the workplace, right? We want to feel comfortable with it. And this is a journey. This is not going to happen overnight, but it is about the experience, and it is about the journey on how we can get there together. Thank you.